Hello everybody and welcome to the Surge Podcast. Um, so, uh, I was going to be talking about combat sports over the next month or so, and combat sports medicine. Um, in terms of recovery, from the weight cuts, how to examine pe- people, how to assess them pre-fight, assess for safety post-fight, uh, stoppages, rehab, everything. Like I was going to do a, a comprehensive sort of one-on-one of the whole thing, or a blue belt level discussion about the whole thing, because I feel that it's something that's very beneficial, especially as they become more and more popular. However, um, I got a very touching email from uh, one of uh, your subscribers, you wonderful, wonderful subscribers, um, asking me to start talking about how to do humanitarian work, uh, because that person was hoping uh, to go and help out uh, in Ukraine. Um, full disclosure, um, I've been doing humanitarian work for a while. Um, I started as a student um, and gradually as I matured um, a little bit, a little bit of matureness, um, I began to uh, work more and more in, in more conflict-based situations. and. Um, it's one of those things that's ultimately very fulfilling if you have the right attitude walking in. So, in no particular order, uh, nor with any evidence base apart from my own humble experiences, um, I'd like to talk about the things that I should have done better and uh, the things that uh, probably will set you up to do better than, than I did in the beginning at least, because it was very intimidating. Um, first off, start with something closer to you and easy. That should be very, very simple to understand, but uh, the logic behind it is that we all know that we like to do things that are sort of more cool trauma shit-like or resuscitative. That's, that's why we're in this business, right? But for you to be able to do those things well in your own hospital is completely different than you doing it with a forward surgical team or something of the equivalent, which is completely different from you doing field medicine. And so, starting with something that will get you used to the fact that you're going to be carrying a backpack along with you, get used to the fact that you're going to have to work out the engineering logistics of a certain place to set up a hut and things like that, or a tent, while giving out vaccines or antibiotics might be a good idea, especially a medical student level. That's in fact how I started. I literally went on a trip with an NGO in which all we did was give out vaccines and deal with simple medication-related issues and suture up cut wounds and things like that. The rest of it, we sort of arrange for transport for. And I think that that's a very good place to start, especially if you're a medical student or a first year resident, second year resident even. And it helps you to build the relationships that you need, A, and B, be able to be competent and confident when it's time to hit the action. Gradually, I would propose, and what I did was, I started to do elective surgeries with these organizations. So things like scrubbing in with orthopedics guys for corrective surgeries for pediatrics, Uh, scrubbing in with uh, cardiac surgeons for pediatric heart stuff, or dealing with the anesthesia side. In fact, I learned a lot of what I, well, a little of a lot of whatever little I know from from those trips in terms of things like cardiac anesthesia for damage control, so uh, and cardiac resuscitation and things like that. I actually learned a lot from dealing with less austere circumstances. And then you can move on to dealing with more acute conflict-based situations. The second thing is prepare for boredom. It's never as exciting as you might think, and it's not always action. It's not like you're covering uh, the Friday night shift. It's not that. It's, It's a lot more nuanced. There's a lot more organization, there's a lot of stuff that you're going to have to do, there's going to be a pre-brief, there's going to be a lot of discussions before you end up doing something that you would consider exciting. But know that this is part and parcel of the job. It's just like having uh, an easy shift on a given day that's completely boring, right? It's just, it is what it is. It's, It's a very 
very, very annoying thing to travel all that way and to spend the first two days just waiting for patients to come in and get themselves assessed and stuff, but it, it's part and parcel of it. Number three, get a burner phone. So for two reasons. The first is, especially if you're going to a conflict ridden place, you don't want your personal information to travel back with you to the States or Canada or Australia or the UK or wherever else you're going. Because you don't know if there are certain people there that might have prejudices against what you're doing. So a burner phone is essential for that. The second reason is because of the fact that you can give that phone as a gift to somebody else with that line in it. Because sometimes communication becomes key and these things are very precious to the local team, the people who work locally with the NGO. So that's extremely important. Four separate emails. By separate emails, I mean uh, you should honestly have your own work email and your own personal email that you use for Facebook or whatever else have nothing to do with your contacts and you contacting people from there. The first is because certain people will target your email for spamming purposes and might notify your family or your next of kin or your work that you are doing something else or that you are in danger and try and take advantage of that, right? Fake your kidnapping, for example, because they know what your email is, right? These things aren't uh, high uh, probability things. They're extremely rare, but when they do happen, you have to have a game plan for it. And part of that is obviously having a separate email. Another part of it is a social media purge. So I make all my accounts inactive when I'm traveling or very low activity with the last update over a month ago. And the reason why is so that nobody can take advantage of it by trying to guess your location that you're going to. And nobody can take advantage of it by trying to figure out who your family is and possibly even threaten them, especially if you're going into a conflict zone. In 2022, we all have internet. On the same theme, decide on a proof of life. The proof of life should be a phrase or a story that you can tell that will uh, alert the people around you or your next of kin, your loved ones, your co-workers, whoever they get in contact with, that this is in fact you and you're not being coerced. I've never had to use it, but it's important to organize proof of life. Seven is contacts. So make sure that you assure people that you're only going to be contacting one person as a designated family member and one person as a uh, work-related colleague. So that if other people try and make contact, there's no confusion and it becomes easy to trace and attack, take back. The other thing is, make sure that you have local contacts. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but make sure that you, you, you already talk to the people that you're gonna be working with locally there. And I would say in most circumstances for civilian populations, you're going to have some local contacts. Take some books with you, as in hard copy books. They don't burn through batteries and you can read them for the hours that you're gonna be on the road. Because in most of these places, transport is going to be a bit of an issue. Some places, surprisingly, transport is super easy. Other places, it's a bit of an issue. Respect the local culture. Respect the local culture. You are not there to teach them how to live their lives. And you are not there to um, change their culture. Because it takes years to do that, even if you have things against that culture. It's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take years. It's a process to change a culture. And it's not our job as healthcare workers. As doctors, nurses, EMTs, our job is to be able to provide health care and to be able to work towards a worthy cause. Our job is not to um, try and fix, quote unquote, something. We're not there to do that. And don't take sides either. It's very dangerous to take sides and it's also a little bit unethical to sort of deprive people of health care at a time of need just because they come from a different faction. I'm not saying that if somebody is uh, being violent towards you, you should still treat them. But I am saying if somebody is with a different faction, with a different point of view, that shouldn't affect the way that you do your medicine when you're there. It's extremely important. Because it's not only is it important for you, but it's important for the future of that NGO or whatever institution that's sending people there is going to be. 
That's the issue. Do the research on the local area. So by this I mean what the distances are, where the hospitals are, where could you have another field hospital, this is Donetsk as an example, where the major water supplies are, depending on where you're expecting to go. And then refresh your skills. So if you're uh, an intensivist who very rarely does chest tubes, do that. Hasn't done ATLS in a while, read it. If you are a trauma surgeon who works in a level one trauma center but doesn't have that much ICU experience because they've dedicated their lives to trauma, they can put in an X fix, they can open a chest, they can dissect down the neck beautifully, but they haven't intubated in three years. You might want to intubate once or twice. And if you're the type of person who is very comfortable dealing with ECMO, but has been doing that dedicated as part of their career for the past year and a half to two years because of COVID or something, you might want to scrub into the operating room a couple of times doing elective cases before you get deployed. In the field, at least, if you can't fit it into your backpack, you can't take it. In general, um, depending on where I am, if there's electricity or not and things like that, this is my go-to bag. So I usually have an old laptop, the oldest laptop that I have at the time, and I put Ubuntu on it. The reason why I use Ubuntu is because it'll speed up the laptop. If you're going to use Windows, it's going to be very slow, given how old that computer is, right? So it's probably better to use something that's open source and that's available, and that you can have access to with updates later on. And Ubuntu is not that hard to do. You can look it up on YouTube, and it essentially comes in with everything that you need to install, from photo editing, which should be a priority, obviously, all the way uh, in video editing, all the way up to office stuff. And I tend to set it up with a voice over IP and a VPN at the same time. The, my favorite VPN is private internet access for voice over IP. It depends on the country that you're going to. You're going to have to look it up and test it before you go because some of them are banned in certain countries. The reason why I take that laptop with me is because much like the burner phone, I plan to donate it to them. And laptops are becoming more and more of a scarce resource and they'll be useful for patient tracking in the future no matter what type of practice you, you plan on doing with that company or with that organization. I also take a USB with medical books. The reason why I do that is, first off, right off the bat, they're usually open source medical books or freely distributed. And there's a whole ton of good stuff, right? Um, I also tend to back up any um, foamed uh, content as an offline thing using an offline browser, which is very easy to do as well. If you're interested, I can do tutorials on these things. I put a second USB with my documents and my, a copy of my life insurance with the details. I have a printed laminated ID with my blood type and contact details, preferably in multiple languages. So I tend to have like at least the language of the country that I'm going to, English, and one more language, be it French or Arabic, depending on the region. And it's usually printed or laminated and laminated because paper is not a good idea. It'll just disintegrate, especially if you're in contact with water. I carry a week's worth of underwear and socks, five shirts and two jeans, and two bars of soap, a flashlight with some batteries in it, and water purifying tablets and a sleeping bag. This has been my go-to um, rucksack for a while now. I really, really like the fact that it's modular can be taken apart and re put together and things like that and I can sort of get a small handbag out of it and I like the fact that its color is not very uh, conspicuous because you know sometimes people tend to wear bright colors and it tends to attract the wrong attention. Um, this is something that I invested in. Um, I can tell you it works for temperate climates like I've used this in Kuwait and it's only $21. I don't know how much you need it though. I, it's just that I, I got it because I like to go hiking and stuff and walk around the desert. MREs, so people ask me about rations and canned food and these things. I think that that's more survivalist. And uh, to be honest, I've never been on one of these trips and not gotten food. Uh, you know, you're not gonna get the best food. You might have to wait a little bit. You might be a little bit restricted, but there's always some way to navigate nutrition, right? I would thoroughly recommend that you don't buy equipment that looks like this. Unless you're going into a conflict zone with a particular site for a particular reason. 
And the reason why is because A, you're very likely to attract the wrong attention because people will presume that you're in the military and you might not be. And you may not even know how to fire a gun or even carry a gun with you. And chances are you're not going to be let through any local airports with guns. B, it's very disrespectful to military personnel. Having uh, worked with a lot of military personnel, and most of them are my best friends, uh, I can tell you that it's, it is extremely disrespectful to pretend to be part of the military. These people put their lives on the line as a career so that all of us can enjoy um, protection for our rights and our culture. They also have extremely high level of training beyond the scope of their own field. So they're usually multifaceted in their training, typically speaking. Be it firearms, uh, tank artillery, heavy artillery, uh, mine sweeping, uh, first aid, forward surgical team training. They're tactically extremely tra well trained and they, they put up with a lot to get to where they're at. Okay, so it's extremely disrespectful when you're in a conflict zone or in a place of that nature and you're carrying a rucksack that makes you look like you're in the military when you're not. But the main reason is safety as well. Decide on your goals before that. By that, I mean make sure that your institution confirms the goals with you, which organization you're going with. At the same time, make sure that there's also a person goal list. So is your goal to be fulfilled because you feel that it's, it's extremely draining to work in your current urban trauma center and you feel a little bit disillusioned? Is it so that you can develop a new skill set? Is it because you want to train your, your, you want to mentor some of your trainees? Is it because you want to help to establish a program over there? For example, a trauma program over there. Have those goals ready for you, the personal goals that you want to do, and move on from there. Try to have them assigned and reflect on them before you even leave the country. Uh, wear a uh, windbreaker or a jacket, at minimum. Usually you need something a little bit more, but a windbreaker should always be with you, even if it's a warm country. You never know when you might need it. Uh, get to know the route that you'll be taking, and get to know the closest embassy to you. You don't need to make contact with them necessarily, it depends on your circumstances, but you should know the local, your local backup, effectively speaking. Do the research online. Do the research online. Extremely imperative. And I said it before, I say it again now, because it's not just about where you're going to be going there. It's going to be about where you're going to find food. What are the best routes to them from the hospital? What is the security policy? Are there any factions involved that might not like the way that you look when you're there? Could that be an issue? And if so, how are you going to get protected or are you going to navigate it? And depending on where you're going, things like souvenirs, cigarettes, alcohol, uh, they carry a lot of favor. You can be in places, for example, where there are checkpoints and being able to uh, gift somebody a bottle or a souvenir from your country might go a long way, right? Um, sharing a cigarette with somebody, depending on how you feel about it, might go a long way if there's something that needs to be processed very quickly. It's very important to be able to, to understand the culture that you're going to and what works and what doesn't, obviously. It would be very inappropriate if you went into a culture where this would be considered a huge bribe and very corrupt. So you'd have to understand that, so it depends on where you go, like I said, but have an idea or an inkling of what would be a good gift. Get fit, try and start a month beforehand. Usually it's short notice, but you should try and start a month beforehand. For me, I personally go running, do bodyweight training, and do some jujitsu. The reason why I do jujitsu is because I find that the people that I'm deployed with, there's usually at least one or two people that do judo and jujitsu, which are very close to each other. I find that it helps me to de-stress and helps me to think. And it's an excellent workout. You will just you will lose the weight and your muscle development will go through the roof. It's it's amazing. So I per prefer to do that with running and some body weight training. And the reason why is because you don't need to carry gym equipment when you get deployed. So if you start early and you've developed that routine and you already know it off by heart, it's very easy to just keep it going there because you're going to need it. 
you're going to be carrying a rucksack on your back for a long time, extended periods of time. You're going to be building some infrastructure in some cases, like huts. You're going to be laying down piping, electricity. That's a lot of construction style work that requires somebody who can run, who can lift heavy things. So you have to bear that in mind. Think about it, even the medical equipment that you're gonna have in some cases is going to be rather heavy. I'd like to spend a couple of weeks beforehand just watching the top 10 YouTube videos from, the, from that country. I use the VPN for that same reason and I read around the culture as well, okay? I find that it helps me establish rapport with the local population and it helps me put myself in their shoes. It, it definitely makes things a little bit, little, little bit easier in general. Lastly, don't be a fucking asshole. Don't be that cowboy who's taking selfies uh, to send out, be a douche on Instagram. Don't be um, that guy who uh, is a loud mouth or that person who's a loud mouth at the cafeteria or at the mess hall where people are just trying to recover from a tough night. Don't, don't be that guy or that person. Take the time to reflect on the fact that you're, you're going to a place where nobody knows you and a place where if they don't like you, everything's going to go bad. Everything's going to go bad. It's bad for the organization that you're working with. It's bad for you. You're not going to get your goals done. So always be courteous and always extend a little bit more courtesy than you normally would. Be super nice to everybody. Be super nice to everybody. Not that you're not nice regularly, I'm just saying. Be super nice to everybody. In terms of other stuff, so depending on where you go, you might want some eye protection. Goggles or something of that nature. If you're taking medications, take them with you. Take some air protection, particularly in loud areas. For example, areas where there's no, there's going, there, there might be some blast injuries or something like that. If you need a helmet and they won't provide it, take it with you. Same thing with uh, plates, you know, like as in bulletproof plates. In some, certain situations, you're going to have to have that with you. I would not recommend carrying around weapons. It just makes things worse for you at airports and government checkpoints. You might have somebody else with you who's responsible for that, a head of security, for example. But that's not your role. Your role is not to carry around a weapon. Uh, in summary, this is one of the most important things that you can do. Having, you know, experienced it firsthand myself, it's, it's one of the most important things that you can do. Humanitarian work is ultimately extremely fulfilling and everybody does it differently and every organization does it differently but I hope that some of these pointers help people out um, the last thing that I would say is plan for a vacation right afterwards and I'll tell you why it's because despite the fact that it's very fulfilling oftentimes after spending some time operating every single day on uh, kids with X, Y, and Z, or on patients who have not received access to healthcare in a while and have massive goiters, or on uh, trauma patients, day in and day out with somebody very close to the, the conflict itself. After you spend a couple of weeks doing that, if not a couple of months, and you come back to your normal work environment where the pace is slightly lower, the sense of urgency is much lower, and you've reached a point where the priorities that you have at work aren't the same priorities as you had last week when you were in that conflict zone. An example would be if they wanted to have a meeting about uh, antibiotic policies, which is extremely important, but in the context of where you were, where you barely had any antibiotics, and you saw some things that you may not have wanted to see or may not have wanted to experience, but you've already been through it and now you're stronger for it, you will fly off the handle, you will be a little bit angry, you will be a little bit annoyed, uh, you will be a little bit disillusioned. I think, I think if the best way for me to put it is that the, for the first couple of weeks, you will have lost some sense of your purpose. So I always plan for a vacation because during that time period it gives me some time to reflect. And it doesn't have to be a month, it could be three or four days, it could be a week. You're not taking an extended time off. It's impossible to do if you're already going to be doing humanitarian work for a month, right? 
but you need that those 10 minutes to get back into be, being your your work self and your family self that you haven't been in a while and it takes a while um, please let me know if you have any questions the next episode is also going to be um, around the theme of treating patients overall I'll be talking about um, an approach to the injured patient sort of from white belt to black belt level very similar to my ionotropic video and the episode after that will be on mass casualty training and then another episode on active shooter scenarios if it happens in a hospital god forbid um, good luck to everybody and uh, I hope that it comes to a peaceful resolution I'd like to thank our friends from Dar Scrubs. They're not really my sponsors. They're just a very good company here in the Middle East that provides us with scrubs with easy return policies. Um, they are uh, very approachable, either online or by phone. And if you're living in Kuwait, it's a same-day delivery, which is awesome. And Vinyl Destination has provided us with the music. Uh, Vinyl Destination is Kuwait's premier uh, place for vinyl and most audiophile needs. If you're not bored yet, please like, comment, and subscribe. Uh, thank you all for making this reach a thousand followers. Uh, it means a lot. Um, the quality is still a little bit sketch. Uh, you're hearing an echo right now because the studio is still not finished. I'm going to have a soundproofed area in my house, and uh, I promise that the quality will get better over time. Thank you all for your support, and have a good day, and good luck to everyone.